First of all, congratulations. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, so you've, you've only been in the country for a, a few short years and, and you're already wearing <laughs> Thomas of the Year. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, well, it's just very nice to be, rec to be recognised. Uh, I'd worked on New Zealand before I came to New Zealand. Uh, right. I, I came here in, as a visiting scholar in 2002 uh, to the Treasury and started doing some research on the Australian tax system back then. So, although it was another five years before I came to live in New Zealand, at least I had some knowledge or had worked a bit on the economy. Okay, and one of the things you've been cited for is the work on setting up the tax working group. Yeah. And and your work through that. Um, so talk us through that. How did that sort of come about, the idea of, of setting up a group like that? Well, we'd done some work. I, I mean, I came over to join Treasury as part of their tax team with the idea of giving the government, which the, that time, of course, was... Dr. Colin as finance minister, but giving them some advice on medium-term tax reform. Okay. Um, and so I came, did some work leading up to the briefing for the incoming minister, which turned out, of course, to be a new minister. Um, and so we were quite keen that the new government coming in, that we should have A, good advice to give them, and B, tested advice, that we'd try to get some peer review, as it were, and feedback from others before we started formally giving minister advice about what we think thought he should do about tax reform. So the idea, it wasn't just my idea, the idea really evolved of having a few seminars, considering who we should invite to those seminars and deliberately target people that we felt understood the New Zealand tax system, understood its problems and its good points, and that they could then assess what, as Treasury and Inland Revenue Advisors, we were thinking of putting forward. And in this essence, we decided, well, we needed to go to ministers with this to get approval for doing it. Um, and the idea was, well, why don't we make the whole thing much more public? Right. make it a proper process, um, we'll get peer review, we'll get comment, um, and ministers were up for that, and that's really how it happened. So it ended up having quite strong ministerial buy-in because they were keen to see the public debate happen. And in terms of the outcome of that tax working group report, well, we know what all the changes have been. Um, do you think they were sufficient as, as to where you thought it was heading when you, you started the project? I think... Well, as an academic and as an economist, you've got this idealised view of what the tax system should look like in a sort of perfect economic world. And anything that's going to be implemented in the political arena is never going to do that. Right. And indeed, the, the appropriate tax system depends on different people's value judgments. If you want a tax system that's going to do lots of redistribution, you may have to be willing to sacrifice some efficiency properties. Mm -hmm. If you want a very efficient tax system or one that nobody can avoid, it might not be very good at redistributing income. So it would be broad based. It would be much more broad yeah. based and it might not have as much emphasis on income taxes, which we know are the primary vehicle within the tax system mm -hmm. of um, redistributing. So in thinking about what's the right kind of tax system, you've got to weigh all these up. And, mm -hmm. and then you've got the choice between corporate tax changes versus personal tax changes. Mm -hmm. um, and inevitably, the government's got different views on what it wants to achieve and the the tax, I think the reform that we ended up with was probably a mixture of what most economists would say were really good changes, um, sensible things to do to improve the working of the system, and others will be a matter of personal preference. Um, some sure. people would like them and some people wouldn't. And at least it kicked off a debate, I guess. So yes, on, on and I don't think the debate's over. I mean, uh, as you probably know, we're organising here at Victoria University a set of debates, one of which is going to ask the question, should the tax rate on capital income be lower than it is now? Mm -hmm. So one thing the tax reform did was to reduce tax rate on certain investments to 28%, same as the corporate rate. Mm -hmm. But other things are still taxed if you're a top rate taxpayer at 33. Right. Well, let's talk about that because uh, you mentioned in, in the debate, the release about the debates, how in Scandinavia it's half the price, sorry, half the, the rate, uh, the taxation on income. So, so what, what are your thoughts about that, being a, a, a tax... A tax man, I guess. Well, again, it, it come, there are two issues. One is the feasibility of introducing a tax system that taxes some types of income very differently from others. Mm -hmm. And the Scandinavians have, have made it work, but they've made it work by having all sorts of rules around defining what counts as capital income and what counts as labour income. Okay. And we know when you and I earn income, say, from interest on the bank, that's fairly obviously capital income. Mm -hmm. We haven't been working to earn that money. But there's a whole set of types of income um, entrepreneurs earn, for example, capital gain type income. Is it all cap income from capital or how much is it, in a sense, reward for you using your brain power as an individual? Right. So you've got to be very careful about how you specify different types of income and that's a tricky thing to do. So if New Zealand was to go down that route, that would be a careful thought. Okay, so that would be another huge debate. So that would be another huge debate. The other issue is we know that 
it may be more efficient to tax capital at a lower rate because that way perhaps you don't lose capital flowing abroad that it otherwise would. But it means that people, and it's typically higher income people, who earn a greater fraction of their income from capital income, they're getting a free lunch, as it were, uh, relative to other taxpayers. The argument is you incentivise the people to have that capital there, and that yep. has the flow-on effects, yep. I guess. Yep. So. It has flow-on effects, but it's very hard to persuade somebody at the bottom end of the income distribution who's earning, say, 40,000, 40, 20,000 a year, um, all entirely through um, source deductions, employee, mm. pay, YE, that why should they be being taxed at a higher rate than others are being taxed on their capital income when they're earning a lot more? Right, and there's also the argument, obviously, of um, the disparity between capital gains on housing and capital gains, say, on, or the capital income on term deposits. Yep. Obviously, there's obviously a disincentive there still. Yeah. So would you like to see that evened out? I would like to see it evened out. Um, you may remember at the time of the Tax Working Group, well, that's how much detail you read into it, but the Tax Working Group had a difference of view about capital gains tax, right. and the Treasury and Inland Revenue had different views about advising on a capital gains tax. And it is a balance between pros and cons as ever. I came from the British system where when I first arrived in New Zealand, I never thought I would recommend a capital gains tax because the British system was one of the at the time was one of the worst examples. Lots of carve-outs, all sorts of complications that just made the system very difficult to apply. you got the GST system over there as well. Yes, same yeah. with GST. Lots of exemptions, lots of different ways of applying it. In New Zealand, my on-balance view at the time of the tax working group was that probably the ability of others to avoid tax, who you would otherwise like to be paying tax, was sufficient to say we ought to look at trying to introduce a capital gains tax, but introducing it around the same rate we would tax any other income, right? Uh, which is different from setting up a separate tax specifically for capital gains, which I think, like the British system, does cause all sorts of difficulties. Cool. So you just broaden the definition of income. Broaden tax. the definition of income, yeah. Right, fantastic. Um, now, a lot of your work over the past few years has been around um, government spending and, and yep. the effects that the size of government can have on an economy's growth, um, and and you've you've found a few sort of growth growth enhancing expenditures and not so growth en enhancing expenditures. Can you sort of take us down that path and, and tell us what that work was was about? Really? Well, there's obviously been a lot of debate, not just in New Zealand, elsewhere, about the size of government and whether um, output is lower or growth rates are output are lower when you've got big government. And an obvious reason why it would be is if you've got the government takes 40% of the economy, it's basically going to have to raise 40% of the economy in taxation. Mm. Um, and that is a, we think, is a big disincentive for people to earn. Whereas if it's, the government's taking 20% of the economy, that's much less revenue it's got to raise, so it's going to distort the economic system much less. Sure, but there are certain but, types of government spending that are... Yeah, that growth enhanced. yeah. So, and yeah. I mean, some people would argue that the size issue is the biggest issue. I would argue that quite separately, um, and I wouldn't like to make a judgment about which is the bigger, but quite separately, what you spend on appears to make a difference. If you're spending on lots of social welfare payments, that can have a positive effect on growth. It can improve people's health, mm. it can, depending on how you, can, you structure it, it might encourage people into the labour force or minimise the discouragement. So it's not, it's not necessarily negative, but a common um, piece of evidence from other countries is that lots of transfer payments, social welfare benefits, don't tend to enhance growth. Even if they don't undermine it, they certainly don't help. Mm. But if you spend on health expenditures that affect workers in the population, if you spend on infrastructure, if you spend on education, we know that these are generally positive things for growth. Um, and there is some evidence now. There's not a lot of evidence, and it's quite difficult, you can imagine, to differentiate between the growth effects of different sure. categories of spending, but I think there's enough evidence to lead us to feel we should explore that avenue and begin to, to look at, um, or begin perhaps to take seriously the possibility that the kind of things we spend on will affect our growth rates. So uh, what, what, what do you think about the mix in New Zealand? Are we doing enough on those growth enhancing sort of things, or is it too early to call? Or? Well I think New Zealand, the evidence in New Zealand is, is reasonably um, good in the sense that we spend quite a high proportion of our total spending on education, health and infrastructure. I think the debate in New Zealand is probably more around how we spend it within these categories. Right. Um, for example, there's a big issue around whether we do enough within education to help people who are way below median education levels rather than spend lots more on the tertiary sector. The evidence mm. seems to be the tertiary sector in New Zealand is, is very good. It's, it, to the extent it can be growth enhancing, it probably is growth enhancing, 
but what about down at low decile schools? Right, so they have to redirect really that spending within the education. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, and that this is going to be one of the debates, obviously, is uh, the size of government. The size of government. Well, we're having a debate, yes, on the on the size of government, but mainly it's about whether we should be limiting the way governments choose to to grow their expenditure. So okay. it's, it's more about um, making sure governments consult uh, the population and the merits of that on a regular basis before making public expenditure decisions. Sure. And you, you, you mentioned company uh, taxes a bit before. You've done some work on behavioural responses of corporates and, and companies to two different. Um, tax rates and how uh, corporate tax settings are affecting innovation and, and risk taking. Uh, what do you, what's the work being done around there? And I know you're doing work as the, the chair of the, the school at Vic around this. Yes, I've, I've done a little bit. I haven't done a great deal of work on corporate tax as yet. Okay. I'm currently working on okay, corporate right. tax okay. um, effects in New Zealand. I've done a little bit on OECD countries. And that's essentially been asking the question, if you look at firm level, how firms behave, what determines their decisions to invest, and particularly to invest in things that might be innovative, that would involve R&D expenditures, that would be productivity enhancing. And there is some evidence, not just from work I've done, but from work that other economists have done, that suggests that even at the firm level, if you have a high corporate tax rate, it tends to discourage those firms from doing R&D or the kind of innovations that they otherwise do. And so that will have knock-on effects. So on is the answer just lowering the corporate tax rate? Well, the answer could be a variety of things. Well, some people have argued R&D tax credits, for example. Why not target R&D directly if that's the main source of innovation? Others, I'm more sceptical of that argument. It's largely because when I've seen R&D tax credits in practice, there tends to be a lot of rorting by companies right. that, whose accountants tell them, all you have to do is the following in order to get the funds. Yeah, and that's it what we've been told now by the government. I think. Yeah, and I, I mean, there is evidence. There's evidence both ways, actually, um, for other countries that suggests... There is, there is a link between R&D spending and firms' productivity growth, but there's also a tendency for firms to claim more R&D tax credits without us actually being confident that they are genuinely all being used for productivity-enhancing okay. new investments. So what other ways are there to incentivise this R&D spending other than lowering corporate tax rates? Well, the, on, the only other kind of obvious thing is to look at the other side of the corporate tax ledger, which is the deductions. You can tax mm -hmm. the profits at a different rate, but you can also do things with deductions. Um, you could... Uh, choose to tax profit when firms earn what we would call more than a normal return. So mm -hmm. if, if firms around the country would normally expect to make a 5% return, but when they take a particularly risky opportunity, that might lead to negative return, of course, mm -hmm. but it might lead to big positive returns, much bigger than 5%. And you could say, well, let's just tax those excess returns, sure. um, because these are the ones that we can uh, tap into and regard as specific to the firm or specific to their location in New Zealand. Okay. Um, now, another something you've, you've been doing work on is uh, fiscal decentralisation <laughs> against yes. uh, revenue decentralisation. And um, this is, I guess, the idea of um, subnational governments within countries, how they can, can control government expenditure and how they can control the, the taking in of revenue. Yeah. And you find that revenue decentralisation. Uh, it, there's a, there's a sort of, it's um, associated with higher growth than fiscal decentralisation. Is that well? What, yeah. what we what we find is if you think most governments um, when they decentralise will decentralise expenditure much more than they'll decentralise revenue. Mm -hmm. So they'll carry on raising, let's say, income tax at the national level, yeah. and they'll give grants to local government, mm -hmm. and then local government does more spending than it's raising in domestic revenues. Sure. So in New Zealand, like in the UK, domestic rev uh, local revenues are raised through property taxes, mm -hmm. but they get big grants from central government, in the UK at least, less so here, um, grants from central government to help them spend. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, it's a bit like saying to a household, you can spend $100, um, but you've only got to earn $50, we'll give you the other 50 mm -hmm. Well, that kind of encourages you to perhaps spend in unproductive ways. It might also encourage you to spend more than you otherwise would spend, because local government doesn't face the true cost of raising the revenue. So what our evidence tends to suggest is those countries that get a closer match between the revenue that's raised locally and the spending that's done locally tend to have higher growth rates. Okay, so does that argue for less local authority spending or does it argue for more local authority power 
over how they raise funds? Could, could they perhaps set company tax rates in their area or something like that? Or? You wouldn't want them to set company tax rates in their area, not, at least not usually, because you just imagine if Wellington's sure. company tax rate was yeah. 50% and Tawa was uh, 30%, sure. we know where companies would choose to locate. But you could do it through taxes on things like property that are mm -hmm. relatively immovable. Um, or you have to think more carefully about what you can afford to fund locally and therefore spend locally. Um, and that just raises difficult questions about who do you think is best able to take key decisions. Sometimes education, for example, some of these decisions need to be taken locally. Um, you don't want central government deciding how big the classroom should be or how much spending there should be in school X versus school Y in a particular locality. Mm. That's kind of local democracy needs to decide that. But then if local de democracy is going to decide on the spending, how do you marry that up with the decisions on local versus national funding it through tax revenue. Yeah, right, and obviously the Productivity Commission, I think, is, is looking at this at the moment. So uh, I wasn't aware they were. It's a timely debate, yeah. Right. Um, you've also done a bit of work on population ageing and demographic changes. Yes. And um, it's quite a politically charged debate at the moment, I guess. Um, but you do, in one paper, on the taxation and, and and the Asian population, uh, you note how the cost of NZ Super are going to possibly double over the next 40 years and that some difficult choices are inevitable if yep. the policy parameters were to remain unchanged. So what has to change, in your view, around that debate over the next few years? Well, interestingly, I mean, we know the Treasury is going to report early next year on their latest analysis of what they think needs to be done and what needs to change, and I, I'm part of that process as an outsider. Um, I think it's not a case really of what needs to change. I think it's a case of recognising that there are some choices and we will need to make choices. Okay. And if we don't do anything, that is a choice. Right. So leaving national super at the current age of eligibility, the current indexation and so on, is a legitimate choice that we can choose to make. But what we want to know is what's the implication of that out into the future for other things if we mm -hmm. choose to make that choice. And I think it's fairly clear that Social expenditures uh, will rise as a proportion of the national income if we leave existing settings mm -hmm. as they are and we observe the same kind of trends in people's preferences and demands and so on that we've seen in the past. So for me, it's about understanding the trade-offs so that you can say to a government, and a government can say to their electorate, we think we're going to have to spend more on, on New Zealand super if we stick with the way it is. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Do right. you want to do that or do you want to spend less on it and therefore have more to spend on other things? Right, so one of the trade-offs is increasing tax rates, yep. obviously, but as the population ages, you, you argue in here, there's an importance of maintaining uh, spending yep. from consumers to, to help, I guess, keep the aggregate demand and the economy going. Mm. Um, so that's one trade-off and obviously the other trade-off is changes to the super regime. Yes. Yes, so I mean, many countries have chosen the changes to super type of regime. Right. I mean, we know that New Zealand is, in a sense, relatively backward, for want of a better word, in making the decision to raise the age of mm. eligibility for super. Um, on the other hand, super is indexed to wages. Many countries don't formally index their pensions to wage rates. The UK, for example, formally indexes it to prices, but from time to time will make decisions to uprate pensions at rather faster than that. So there are implications for New Zealand super that are rather different from other countries, and the indexation to wages tends to push the cost up more than some other countries would have. Okay, right, so if you take that away though, that could, I guess, A, cut the payments, but B, earlier on, incentivise more public savings, do you think? Um, well, I'm not sure about, it could incentivise more public savings. make up for the potential shortfall in the future of... Yeah, so I mean, if you, if you cut back public expenditure because you're no longer paying so much in super, mm then as long as government doesn't spend its revenues on other things, you're encouraging public savings. You may, you may encourage individuals to save more. That's, Sorry, private That's savings. what you meant by... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So private savings, um, if we know that we're going to have less guaranteed government pension in 20 years' time, and let's say I was to retire at 20 years' time, that kind of person would think, well, I'm going to have to prepare a bit more for that. And that's partly what KiwiSaver is yeah. about. It's about encouraging people, in this case with some government subsidy, to think seriously about preparing for their own retirement. Right, and just quickly to finish off these, um, another thing you've been cited for is um, setting up the economics network yeah. um, a couple of years ago. And so you do have these series of debates, and the, the first one is tonight, yep. Tuesday night. 
Um, so the first debate, obviously we've gone through the government spending one, we've gone through taxation of capital income. Another one is uh, should the government sell 100% of the, the state-owned enterprises? What was the thinking behind setting up the parameters of that debate? The thinking was that the debate we've seen up to now has largely been about do it as the government is doing it or don't do it at yeah. all. Um, but actually, going back, for example, to Margaret Thatcher's era in the UK, the debate was all about sell it all or don't sell it. Right. Uh, there, wasn't a, there was some debate around the government having the equivalent to the New Zealand golden share peers where you keep 1% or 50% plus one share is held by the government. But a lot of it was around complete privatisation. And as we know, many would argue quite successfully, big companies, big utilities, for example, mm -hmm. um, water companies, electricity companies, gas companies, were fully privatised in the UK and then subjected to regulation. And there are pros and cons around that. So it struck me that you know, maybe we should start to get the debate here asking questions about, well, why 51% retained and only 49% I think sold? it's a political number. Um, it is a political number. Yeah. I mean, it clearly allows governments to say, we've we retained control. Yeah, yeah. yeah, don't worry, we're still in control. Um, and there are probably some economic gains as well, um, as well as economic downsides. So the debate, in a sense, is just to try and get people to say, well, exactly what are the, the gains and the, the losses? What could be the gains, you think, going on? Of 100%? 100%? Yeah. Well, one of the biggest disadvantages of the government keeping a share is that investors are not fully confident about taking risks because they don't quite know when the government will choose to exercise its power, mm. or when particular ministers, yeah. could be 20 years down the line, some minister decides to interfere. Um, um, implicitly or explicitly with the way the companies run. And so investors are just a little bit more cagey when they know that they, don't, they can't rely on the market in a sense completely to determine the returns they'll get from their investment. Um, and if you look at um, British Gas was a good example of a company that I think most people would agree was fairly successfully privatised. Good regulation was put in place so the company couldn't just raise prices and use its monopoly power to raise prices on gas consumers. Um, but has given good return to investment uh, because it was just put in the private sector. Right, but then again, it could be good that the government does keep the majority stake, perhaps to stop private rotting, or is that argument raised, or do you think? Um, I think it's very difficult. Private, if, if you haven't got regulation, mm -hmm. then if, if by private rotting you mean companies doing what's in their interest... Raising um, prices. Uh, yeah, rather than what's in the consumer is, then clearly that's an issue. For me, the question is always, why do you want the government of the day, and perhaps the minister of the day, to have the ultimate control, as opposed to set up an independent body that reports to government or reports to parliament that is responsible for delivering consumer interest? Mm. I tend to think that process is a better process in terms of governance, of making sure that companies behave. But it is a judgment. Politicians um, ultimately are elected to deliver a bunch of things, mm. and if it's reg if key industries like utilities are regarded by voters as things they want careful monitoring of to make sure they don't set monopoly prices. Mm -hmm. And you could argue, well, give it to the people who are elected to do it, and that would be ministers and the government. Sure, and the, and the final debate is um, on whether we should lower the discount rate for public sector projects for the, the, these cost-benefit analyses on investment. Is there something wrong there, do you think, the way we carry out these cost-benefit analyses? Um, I know you're not arguing in the debate. So I'm not arguing the debate. Potentially there's something wrong in the sense that if you take a discount rate of, let's say, 8%, mm -hmm. that says some project that's not yielding its benefits until way into the future, we're going to value it much less mm -hmm. than something that yields its benefits relatively soon. Um, most people, I think, would take the view that when you measure society's preferences, how, how would society measure um, returns 20 years out versus, tw versus now? they probably wouldn't use 8% to discount the returns. I mean, when we put money in the bank, we don't uh, typically get 8% mm. for sacrificing um, income now. Um, so in terms of social preferences, it's often argued that a number like 2 or 3%, maybe 4%, is more like the way voters evaluate their own income today or their own tax payments today versus tax payments out in the future. Okay, so what but, does this lead to if, if we do have a slower discount rate? Well, one thing it would do is that projects that we think might have big returns, but they're not going to be until way into the future, um, would be more likely, if you were stacking up all the projects you could do, you'd be more likely to select the ones that real yield future benefits than mm. you do with a 8% discount rate. So with an infrastructure, for example, if you're building major dam, major new motorways, 
uh, we said, well, it's another 10 years before they're built, 20 years before they're fully operational. Um, all these benefits compared to the cost we're incurring now will be, at a, as I say, a higher interest rate, like 8%, mm. would look quite small. Suddenly mm. cut the interest rate to 4%, these benefits suddenly look quite big. And so you're so much, it's much more better like for long term thinking. It's much better for projects that are long term in their delivery. Right. Um, again, you take two health projects. Some health projects, it might be a drug treatment that you can pretty much give straight, straight away mm -hmm. and you hope you'll see some effects down the line. Or it could be, no, we need to invest in building new hospitals, new healthcare centres. It'll do the same thing eventually, but it mm -hmm. won't deliver its benefits till later. Well, if you've got a, a high discount rate, the second type of project really st struggles to compete against the drug type of base mm -hmm. project because it's, its benefits seem too uncertain and too far out in the future. Well, I guess um, that's a good place to leave it. And um, again, congratulations on winning the Economist of the Year award. And um, we're looking forward to seeing the seeing those debates and um, the work of the chair of the Public Policy School. Is it? Um, well, the Victoria Business School, yeah, chair of Public School. Finance in the Business School. That's right. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.